Just as there are two sides to every coin, there are two very different possible outcomes to changing sides in a WWE superstar shakeup. Think Socrates might have said that, not really sure. Anywho, we presented a look at 10 instances in which wrestlers switching brands in a draft or shakeup provided a boost to their careers, putting them in a better position to make good on opportunities. Here we will pull a complete 180 and look at those whose changes of scenery were anything but helpful. One day you're a promising blue chipper on a certain weekly broadcast and the next, you're a fish out of water, your gills vainly going into overdrive in an environment that's far from nurturing. Maybe the writers on those shows just don't get you. Maybe your momentum got derailed once surrounded by a different ensemble cast. Pro wrestling can be a precarious balance and not everyone benefits from what could be a hasty move. The following names have all felt the burn of moving to a new home, whether the sting was immediate, eventual, or gradual. Pour one out for the stars ahead because some stories are just plain sad. Oh. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic.com and these are 10 superstars who didn't benefit from being drafted. Join us! Number 10, Christian, Raw to SmackDown 2005. After WrestleMania 20 in 2004, there seemed to be a seismic shift in balance between the two brands as Raw, thanks to an uptick in both story and wrestling quality, became more of the A show than ever, while SmackDown withered away beneath a JBL title reign, new generation style Undertaker paranormality, and rotten events like Great American Bash and Armageddon. The year 2005 saw a little more of the same and WWE couldn't ferry John Cena onto Raw fast enough. The red brand was the place to be. Christian was once a promising part of the flagship show, breaking out as Captain Charisma, but once he was moved to SmackDown as kind of an afterthought, all that potential seemed to dissipate. Forgettable losses in the mid-card marred Christian over the coming months, and the talented heel blended deeper into the scenery. Reportedly, Vince McMahon didn't see Christian as a top guy, leading him to letting his contract last around Halloween that year. After reattaching his cage surname, Christian made tracks for the Impact Zone where he was immediately treated as a king. Number 9, Mr. Kennedy, SmackDown to Raw, 2009. Two years earlier, Kennedy was on the verge of main event greatness. High profile matches with The Undertaker and Batista were in his rear view, and he'd won the Money in the Bank briefcase at WrestleMania 23, almost assuring that before long, he'd be announcing himself as a world champion of some sort. But poorly timed injuries took their toll, halting his stratospheric rise every time he'd built up a head of steam for himself. In 2009, Kennedy, who'd been out of action for eight months with a shoulder injury, switch brands for the third straight year, only this time his move was announced in the supplementary portion of the draft. In other words, his stock had fallen to where he couldn't get to cross over on the draft special with the other big stars. Kennedy only wrestled one match in his comeback, apparently almost injured Randy Orton during a routine move, and was fired four days later. Truthfully, switching brands wasn't the direct mortal blow for Kennedy, but rather number 999 in the death by a thousand paper cuts. Number 8, Jinder Mahal, SmackDown to Raw 2018. Up until the moment that Kofi Kingston pinned Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 35 to become WWE Champion, the following statement was true. The last man to win the WWE Championship on a pay-per-view was Jinder Mahal at Backlash 2017. For almost 23 months, Mahal held that distinction, though his six-month reign was pretty well lambasted by most critics. Winning the belt didn't exactly ramp up his star quality either, as evidenced in his move back to Raw. Jumping to the red brand didn't exactly bring Mahal back to world title form, though in fairness, that ship sailed long ago when WWE realized that he wasn't going to be as big an international draw as they were hoping. After getting walloped by Roman Reigns at Money in the Bank, Jinder took what looks like to be permanent residence beneath a mid-card glass ceiling, peddling a go no where man of peace and tranquility character that is far removed from the top baddie status he'd held a year earlier. The Mahal character was fading on SmackDown, but Raw was hardly a jumpstart for Big Ginny Mac. Number 7, Tajiri, SmackDown to Raw 2004 It's not as though Tajiri completely crumbled on the Raw brand when he made the move in March 2004, but it didn't exactly give us quintessential Tajiri at his fullest potential. On SmackDown, Tajiri was one of the perennial figures of the somewhat thriving Cruiserweight division, sharing the ring with Rey Mysterio, Billy Kidman, Chavo Guerrero, and others in a number of brilliant matches. Tajiri had even adopted his own henchman at this time. There was no Cruiserweight title on Raw, so for all intents and purposes, Tajiri's ceiling 
scheduling was going to be rather limited. Partnerships with Rhino and William Regal only went so far, even though the Regal reunion did net a somewhat forgettable tag title reign. As 2005 wore on, Tajiri receded deep into the undercard, a far cry from his normal weekly placement over on SmackDown. Before year's end, Tajiri left the company, citing a desire to spend more time at home in Japan with his family. Number 6. Heath Slater and Rhino – SmackDown to Raw 2017 for nearly 10 years, Slater has been on WWE's main roster, much of that duration spent as hapless comic fodder. In 2016, his tongue-in-cheek campaign to continue working in order to feed his kids earned him a lot of fan support, and his unlikely partnership with Rhino paid off that crowd investment as they became the first team to hold SmackDown's newly minted tag team titles that fall. But as is often the case with acts rooted in comedy, the novelty can wear off before long. Slater and Rhino moved to Raw the following April, and sadly, very little has been done to rebuild the two talented performers. Slater is the ultimate up-for-anything wrestler that will get any goofy concept over, while Rhino is still a recognizable throwback as well as a capable brawler in his early 40s. And yet, you never see them outside of inevitable job duty when both bring plenty to the table. Phasing an older Rhino down is one thing, but neglecting a still young team player like Slater is a real crime. Number 5. Muhammad Hassan – Raw to SmackDown 2005 Oh, if WWE had their way, Hassan would not have been ruined by this move. They had every intention of making him into a main event star, but perhaps good intentions wouldn't be the phrase for it. When Hassan and sidekick Davari first turned up on Raw, they were angry young men who lamented being stereotyped against due to their ethnic backgrounds. Eventually, WWE said, enough of that realistic nuance, and just cast them in the foreign villain tropes that have been part of wrestling for eons. The move to SmackDown was setting Hassan up to unseat World Heavyweight Champion Batista at SummerSlam that year, only for the perfect storm of ugliness to come together. On an episode of SmackDown that July, Hassan oversaw a group of masked assailants in a collective beatdown of Undertaker that had very grim overtones to it. On the same day as the pre-recorded assault, the London Transit System was besieged by a terrorist attack, making the storyline look even worse. UPN ordered Hassan off of their network, and WWE wrote him out of storylines almost immediately. Number 4 the entire 2007 draft class. For the first time ever in 2007, WWE decided to make a game out of its annual superstar migration. Raw, SmackDown, and ECW wrestlers would battle against each other to win wrestlers to their side, an interesting combination of competitive action and administrative roster shuffling. On an evening where Vince McMahon faked his own death, possibly in order to get out of jury duty, 10 wrestlers changed shows in what may as well have been called the Night of Futility. Not counting the untelevised supplemental portion of the draft, this is how the TV picks played out. Raw gained King Booker, quit shortly after SummerSlam, Bobby Lashley got hurt the following month, then quit soon after, Snitsky made no impact, and Mr. Kennedy shot himself in the foot with injuries and ill-advised comments. SmackDown's Hall included The Great Carly, made an impact much to the fan chagrin, Tory Wilson, inactive after that November, left in 2008, Chris Masters released that November, and Ric Flair retired the following year. ECW gained the Boogeyman, just a novelty act, and Chris Benoit, yeah. Number 3. Chavo Guerrero – SmackDown to Raw 2005 It's not uncommon to see somebody go over to a new brand and almost immediately take on a new gimmick in order to freshen their career up. Johnny Nitro broke on through to the other side, Cody Rhodes took up preening, and Zack Ryder learned the finer points of fist pumping. Woo woo woo, you know it. In the case of Charvito, once separated from Uncle Eddie, he not only took on a whole new gimmick, but he even changed his name to further drive the new role home. Guerrero denounced his Hispanic heritage and took up a conservative middle-class appearance, calling himself Kerwin White. The Kerwin part was presumably a rib on longtime WWE director Kerwin Silfies, while White was, well, what Chavo was supposed to be in this role. Guerrero dyed his hair blonde, drove a golf cart, and made his entrance to faux Sinatra music that Michael Cole now uses in what's probably a double rib. The act went over about as well as you'd expect, and after Eddie's tragic passing that fall, Chavo very quickly returned to his familiar name and look. Number 2. Paul London and Brian Kendrick – SmackDown to Raw 2007 for close to 11 months, the charming and hazy hooligans sat atop SmackDown's tag team scene as champions, defeating duos such as Eminem, the Hardy Boys, the Pitbulls, and others in what amounted to a dominant, if sometimes forgotten, reign. 
London and Kendrick's high-flying offense, expert-level selling, and tag-team continuity made them one of the best duos to watch during the decade, and one would think that getting pulled to Raw would only give them a bigger stage to show their skills. Aside from a quickie house show reign as tag champs in September 2007, London and Kendrick were afterthoughts on Raw. This was made evident when the two saved Triple H from a three-on-one assault, and the game showed what a manly man he is by beating both cruiserweights up. Some have speculated that the duo's fall from grace stemmed from London smiling through Vince McMahon man's descent into madness, while the rest of the lowly non-McMahons looked on with stone-faced concern, but that just seems petty, so it's probably true. The duo split the following spring when Kendrick went to SmackDown, making their move to Raw a rather wasteful endeavor. Number 1. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn – SmackDown to Raw 2018 one of the freshest bones of contention for WWE fans concerns the sterilization of Steen Erico when the latter-day Quebecers came to Raw shortly after WrestleMania 34. Owens and Zayn had built up their conniving duo act in a solid rivalry with showrunners Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan, so you'd figured they'd be just as effective on Raw in similarly compelling feuds. And to that we ask you, how many times have you heard SmackDown to Raw in this list alone? We also ask you who had it worse. Sami Zayn for his incredibly lame expose of Bobby Lashley's sister before getting thoroughly trounced by his perpetually smiling rival, or Kevin Owens for dying a new death every single week at the sadistic hands of Braun Strowman. There's nothing wrong with heels getting theirs in the end, but how often did either man truly have the upper hand? The two could have been among Raw's villainous upper echelon, but were instead just a couple more reasons why fans hold their breath when their heroes go from blue to red. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments down below. You can follow us on Twitter at Cultaholic. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do here at Cultaholic, you can pledge to us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And most importantly, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us.